stands for feline leukemia virus, but it's shortened just because that's a mouthful to FELV, which most people are familiar with those initials. Feline leukemia is a virus, um, much like any virus that people get or other cats get, that takes over and weakens their immune system in cats. And unfortunately, once they are infected with it, um, the virus takes up residency in the bone marrow and starts changing how they are able to react to things in the environment. One of the first things most clinics do is run a quick test. Um, it's a little test that you draw a small amount of blood and you put it in there. Most tests these days test for three things, feline leukemia, FIV, which is affectionately known as kitty AIDS, and thirdly, heartworm disease. And in a matter of about 20 minutes, if it comes back showing up um, a blue dot under the FALV, you know that the kitty's been exposed. That's the first line of determining a kitty has been exposed to it. We require additional testing because they can actually fight the virus off over time. Not always, but many times they can. So then there are additional tests that we do to make sure that they truly have it before a kitty comes to our sanctuary. After you do this initial test, even if you do a second SNAP test after say 30 to 45 days, it still behooves everybody if you can afford it to do a more rigorous test. We require that because we've had too many instances where the SNAP test still has been wrong. It's a point in time and from what I understand, the amount of virus in their system can vary. There's a test out now that's kind of the gold standard. It's called a quantitative PCR, where it looks at the disease and can say it's actually in the bone marrow and the cat is truly infected. One of the things I'm always asked is, how is the virus trans transmitted among cats? Mating is number one. Uh, we find a lot of situations where that's the main thing, but also through snot and saliva. In cats that live outdoors though, you'd still have to do, the cats would have to be eating a lot of each other's snot and saliva to have it transmitted to a cat that wasn't already you know, positive for it. The good thing is, even here, if a cat snots on me and you know, sneezes and I get it all over me, it dries very quickly. And I tell our volunteers, as long as it's dried, by the time you get home, you're really at no risk of giving it to your uh, cats at home. But, you know, obviously it'd be nice to just wash your clothes anyway, you know how it is with cats sneezing and allergies. So we just encourage you to do that anyway. But those are the main ways it's transmitted. It's really not airborne. Some people think it is. Now, if a cat's sneezing, it, you know, snot droplets can go through the air, but otherwise it's really not um, that transmissible unless you have the fluids. Usually 30 to 45 days, conventional wisdom is they could fight it off because it's just floating in the bloodstream. It hasn't altered their um, bone marrow or underlying makeup. In the case of kittens, it's often passed from their mother to them. And we have had kittens and we've seen situations where kittens at six weeks or eight weeks of age might be positive, but by 14 to 16 weeks, they could have actually fought it off. So it is possible. And so those are kind of rough time frames in which that could happen. There is a vaccine. It's a series of two shots that are given and you have to keep them up annually boosted. For cats that go indoors and outdoors, it would be highly recommended. For your house cat, if they're not going outdoors, not so much, you wouldn't have to but um, it is a vaccine that's been around for many, many years. Other than that, there really isn't anything out looking to prevent uh, feeling leukemia or curing it. When you look at the numbers, if you take all cats that are out there, indoor and outdoor, only about one to 2% are infected with the disease. Look at the population of cats that are outdoors. In some places, it could be up to 10%. So it's hugely skewed to that environment. The main things that we watch for would be not eating well, lethargic, 
those would be the two big ones that we say mm, maybe something is brewing um, that you know you need to get them to the vet blood work usually is very quick to tell or if they're having problems breathing sometimes labored breathing um, one of the ways the leukemia shows up is we often see masses in the chest so it makes it hard to breathe we have found um, some ways with some oral chemo drugs to extend their lives. Sometimes it's only another month. Sometimes it's been up to six months. But it gives them a chance to have a little bit longer life. When they're lethargic, it's often because their bone marrow is now doing weird things. Sometimes it's not making red blood cells anymore. And like with humans, you need red blood cells to carry oxygen to your organs. So. If you're not making them, then it's going to be a very slow process where, you know, slowly your organs won't be functioning very well. Ideally, these cats probably should live separate from other cats that aren't infected with feline leukemia. But if you're vaccinating them and put down lots of food bowls and water bowls, that transmission um, gets diluted if you have multiple food bowls and water bowls so that any virus that's in the saliva would dissipate. So you could actually mingle them together. Um, but otherwise, it's ideal to put them in a situation in a home where they can just be the only cat or get a pair of them or three so that they can enjoy a good quality of life.